one step closer to uncovering the pandemic's origin? Wuhan's virology lab may have already been capable of creating bat coronaviruses in 2018. A newly leaked grant proposal shows the facility was planning to release genetically modified viruses into Chinese bat caves. A Chinese real estate company's debt crisis continues, and it's driving some over the edge. Some Evergrande investors have even attempted suicide. But Evergrande isn't the only company trapped in crisis mode. At least three other real estate companies are struggling to cope with hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. And all American athletes attending the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics will now need to be vaccinated against the CCP virus, the disease that causes COVID-19. The decision comes from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Less than two years before the CCP virus pandemic sprawled across the globe, scientists from the Wuhan Virus Lab were ready to release some gene-edited viruses into bat caves. That's as part of their scientific research, which aimed to make the viruses more infectious to humans. U.S.-based researchers were also involved. Some scientists from the U.S. and China's Wuhan were planning to do some risky research before the pandemic. In 2018, they proposed a project to genetically alter SARS-related bat coronaviruses to make them more infectious to humans, as well as releasing engineered viruses into Chinese bat caves. U.S.-based nonprofit Echo Health Alliance proposed the research to a U.S. military research agency. They asked for over $14 billion in funding. But the U.S. government rejected the idea, saying it could put locals in danger. The U.S. nonprofit is a longtime partner of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the lab at the center of pandemic controversy. Scientists from the Wuhan lab were listed as partners in this proposal. The plan was part of a document dump by a group of scientists and activists trying to determine the origin of the CCP virus. Chemical biology professor at Rutgers University Richard Ebright tweeted out the findings and said the world should be furious at the news. While Alina Chan, a scientist who works at MIT and Harvard, said even though the proposal was rejected, there's a good chance some preliminary research work has already been done. A fact sheet from the U.S. State Department earlier this year reported that the Wuhan lab has been researching virus engineering, but noted that the facility hasn't been transparent or consistent about its record, particularly when it comes to studying viruses similar to the one that causes COVID-19. Now we turn to China's real estate sector. Evergrande isn't the only company that's in crisis mode. Some of the country's largest real estate developers are also under mounting debt, like China's largest property developer, Vanke, which has a debt of over $200 billion. Another major developer, Country Garden, owes over $270 billion. Trailing behind is Greenland Holding Group, with a debt of over $100 billion. Desperation over China's biggest real estate developing company is soaring. Multiple investors and employees have attempted suicide. As Evergrande's default risk keeps rising. The investors of China's leading real estate company, Evergrande Group, are straining under the pressure. Such high pressure that some have even tried to take their own lives. Li Ling, a resident from Anhui province, invested her entire life savings and that of her parents in Evergrande Wealth Management, a subsidiary of Evergrande Group. She saw no hope of getting the money back and in desperation turned on the gas. Now she's in the hospital. She says many residents in her community had purchased their products because it was a better deal than the bank. We use pseudonyms to protect our interviewees' identities to keep them and their families safe in China. My parents are approaching 90. Their hard-earned money was all invested there. I didn't tell them about the issue. I carry it all by myself, so I couldn't eat or sleep. My husband doesn't know either. If he knew, he would have beaten me to death. I didn't want to live anymore, so I turned on the gas. I'm in the hospital now. An Evergrande employee from Anhui province, Cheng Da, tells us for many years, employees got Evergrande Wealth products. The company leaders assigned what they called purchase tasks to their employees. If anyone failed to buy, the money would be deducted automatically from their wages. Chen says some employees had purchased company stocks for their relatives and friends, too. And adding to the pressure, this month, the company stopped paying its employees. Chen says these factors combined to drive a number of employees to attempt suicide. 
Evergrande forced us to buy its products. That was illegal and fraudulent. We have reported it to the police, but no one has dealt with it yet. Now employees cannot receive wages. Our relatives and friends are hurt too. Some employees cannot bear it and don't want to live anymore. There are cases of employees jumping off high-rise buildings. As part of its solution, on Saturday, Evergrande began repaying its wealth product to investors with property, but most of the investors rejected it. In Anhui province, most of the properties are parking spaces, very few houses. Each parking space is valued at about $8,000, and investors note that price had more than doubled. No one can accept that proposal. It's definitely unreasonable. If we don't have a house, why do we need a parking space there? I can't accept the three proposals. The first, 10 percent, is too little. Besides, we don't trust him. All the money is with them. Now they want to trade in property, but I have to pay. I don't have money to pay. An online screenshot shows that a financial advisor of Evergrande, Mr. Wong, posted in his WeChat group alleging, I had a client who heard the news and died from a heart attack. Police intercepted a protest of hundreds of investors in Wuhan and sent them away on a bus. Now we look to the decoupling process between China and the U.S. A new report says direct investment between the two countries is seeing a major plunge, over 70 percent during the past four years. And the sector that saw the steepest decline is tech, an over 90 percent plunge, followed by real estate and healthcare related fields. The report says it may be time for tech executives in the U.S. to make difficult market choices. Two years ago, many American tech companies were looking to get into the Chinese market. But now, with the rising tensions between China and the U.S., tech companies may need to rethink which markets to invest in. Taiwan says there could be a political roadblock in its bid to join a regional trade agreement known as the CPTPP. That's if China joins first. It's called the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, and China wants in. Taiwan is worried a political roadblock from China may prevent it from joining a trans-Pacific trade pact. The self-ruled island filed its application to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, on Wednesday, a week after Beijing submitted its application. Taiwan's chief trade negotiator John Deng said on Thursday there could be potential problems ahead. China has continuously been limiting Taiwan's space for international activity. I think everyone has observed this. Therefore, if China joins the agreement first, Taiwan's membership application will of course be quite at risk. Taiwan has applied to join the CPTPP under the name the Separate Customs Territory of Taiwan, Penghu, Jinmen and Matsu. It's the same name it uses for its membership in the World Trade Organization. But Beijing has always insisted Taiwan is part of its territory rather than a separate country. That's led to Taiwan being excluded from many international bodies. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian on Thursday hit back at Taiwan's bid to join the pact. We resolutely oppose any country's official exchanges with Taiwan and resolutely oppose the Taiwan region's accession to any official agreements and organizations. The CPTPP's precursor, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was originally a 12-member agreement seen as an important economic counterweight to China's growing influence. The unanimous approval of all 11 members is needed for new countries to join the pact. On Thursday, Japan's foreign minister told Kyoido News that he welcomed Taiwan to join the bloc. China's application to the CPTPP could see some obstacles. Beijing has not maintained a great relationship with some of the member nations. Australia, for example. Its trade minister says it will oppose Beijing's bid to join unless China stops its adversarial behavior in trade with Australia. China has also been increasing its military presence around Japan. The Japanese economy minister says they will consult with other nations to determine if China is qualified to join. As he put it, the pact has extremely high standards. The French ambassador will return to Washington next week. He was recalled last week as a protest against a submarine deal. Australia canceled a deal to buy conventional submarines from France and instead turned to the U.S. for nuclear submarines. This deal is part of their effort to counter China's expansion on the seas. NDD's Eddie Atkin brings us the details. U.S. President Biden and French President Macron had a phone call on Wednesday 
This was after a submarine deal with Australia's central relations between the long-time allies into a tailspin. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the 30-minute call was friendly. Uh, it was uh, uh, one where uh, we're hopeful and the president is hopeful. This is a step in returning to normal in a long, important, abiding relationship that the United States has with France. Psaki says Biden reaffirmed the importance of French and European engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. This is after France recalled its ambassador from Washington last week. The French ambassador will return to Washington next week, and he will then start intensive work with U.S. officials. Asked if Biden apologized, Saki sidestepped the question, saying the two leaders agreed to in-depth consultations to rebuild trust. She says Biden and Macron will meet in Europe at the end of October. Hedy Aitken, NTD News. All U.S. athletes attending the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics will now need to be vaccinated against the CCP virus or COVID-19. After a Wednesday announcement from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, Lauren Anthony has more. U.S. athletes hoping to compete at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics will now have to be vaccinated against COVID-19. That's following a decision made on Wednesday by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. CEO Sarah Hirschland said in a statement that from November 1st, 2021, the body will require all staff, athletes and those utilising USOPC facilities to be fully vaccinated against the virus. A requirement that will also extend to the full Team USA delegation at future Olympic and Paralympic Games. The USOPC has added, though, that athletes and staff will have the opportunity to obtain a medical or religious exemption to the mandate. No other major North American sports leagues require athletes to be vaccinated, and the International Olympic Committee did not mandate sports people who competed at the Tokyo Games to have the shot, though it was encouraged. Hirschland added that the move has the support of the Athletes' Advisory Council and National Governing Bodies Council. The decision is further reinforced by the FDA's approval of the Pfizer vaccine and recent mandates made by the U.S. federal government. The Beijing Winter Games kick off on February 4th next year. First, they banned Taiwanese pineapples. Now China's banning Taiwanese apples, affecting 90 percent of the blacklisted crops. And China gave them less than 24 hours notice. NTD's Don Ma has more. China's fruit war with Taiwan wages on. Remember the hashtag Freedom Pineapple that came after China banned Taiwanese pineapples? Now Taiwan is pushing a new hashtag, Freedom Fruit, after China added Taiwanese wax apples and custard apples to the ban. China gave Taiwanese farmers less than 24 hours notice. It announced Sunday morning that starting Monday, it would not accept the locally grown apples. Over 90% of these apples in Taiwan are exported to China. The ban resulted in a surplus of the fruit that local farmers had nowhere to sell. That is, temporarily. Taiwanese officials from all levels of government took to online platforms to promote the banned apples in a campaign to market the fruit to buyers other than China. On Twitter, Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen posted a photo of the custard apple with text saying, We will do all we can to support Taiwan's agricultural sector and make sure that more people enjoy our delicious produce. Taiwan's foreign ministry posted a picture of a pineapple custard and wax apples on its Twitter account. The text reads, let's celebrate together with hashtag freedom fruit and a commitment to stand up for what's right. Taiwan's representative offices from all around the globe showed their support on Twitter by echoing the phrase, let's celebrate together with hashtag freedom fruit. Taiwan's agriculture minister is helping out too. He showcased wax apples on his social media page that people can buy. To counter the Chinese ban, the Swiss Taiwan Chamber of Commerce has also pledged to help import the fruit. According to Taiwan's central broadcaster, Radio Taiwan International, wax and custard apples are currently quickly selling out for some local farmers. China banned the fruit, citing claims of pest infestations, although Taiwan says Beijing hasn't provided any evidence for its claim. It's leading some to speculate whether the ban is politically motivated. Don Ma, NTD News. Now we look to Poland. A gene project there is planning to stop using technology from a Chinese firm. That's over concerns that Beijing could get hold of sensitive Polish gene data. 
Over half of the project funding comes from the European Union, and the project is of no small feat. It aims to build a genomic map of Poland, and in order to do that, it needs to sequence a large amount of genetic data. The project outsourced this work to a third party last year, which has been using technology from a controversial firm, BGI Group. BGI is the largest genome research company in the world. BGI has been working closely with the Chinese military on population research. And an earlier report says BGI might serve as a global collection mechanism for Beijing's genetic databases. It adds the company may give Beijing access to sensitive information about key individuals around the world. BGI says the report is disinformation, but under Chinese law, companies have to hand over data when officials ask for it. And Beijing has been limiting foreign researchers from getting hold of Chinese people's genetic data since 2015. Three entities in India have come under attack from hackers. One of the entities holds the personal information of over a billion Indians. Officials suspect the hacking group is sponsored by the Chinese regime. A new report says the group is suspected of hacking a media conglomerate, a police department and a government agency. The government agency holds residence data in order to issue ID cards. Research by U.S.-based Recorded Future reports that China has had a growing strategic interest in India in recent years. The organization says there is a 261 percent increase in the number of suspected state-sponsored Chinese hacking operations targeting Indian entities already this year compared to last. The report says this follows an increase of 120 percent between 2019 and 2020. The report attributes the group's affiliation to the Chinese regime by highlighting that the malware used is exclusively shared among several Chinese state-sponsored groups. It looks like China may be experiencing some electricity shortages. Chinese provincial authorities are implementing hefty power rationing measures. U.S.-based Radio Free Asia reports that at least five provinces are affected. Authorities are said to be implementing energy rationing across the industrial sector. In Guangdong province, companies have regular weekly scheduled power outages. In Dongguan City, some companies get power outages four days a week. Some even get outages six days a week. The city is dubbed the world's factory, known as a manufacturing hub for exports. The report says that the electricity shortage is caused by rising prices in coal. It's allegedly so high that in Guangdong province, coal-powered plants are losing money for every watt of electricity they produce. China mainly uses coal to produce electricity. In 2019, coal accounted for 65 percent of China's electricity generation. China's pledge to stop building coal-fired power plants overseas. Analysts say that could cull $50 billion of investment as it slashes future carbon emissions. But Beijing's own domestic fuel program still supports coal. China's President Xi Jinping has declared that his country stopped building new energy projects abroad that use coal, a move that was immediately welcomed by the United States and the head of the United Nations Climate Change Conference. The announcement at the UN General Assembly could affect 44 coal plants earmarked for Chinese state financing, totaling 50 billion US dollars, according to Global Energy Monitor, a US think tank. That has the potential to reduce future carbon dioxide emissions by 200 million tons a year, the think tank told Reuters. Environmental groups said it would force big coal financiers like the Bank of China linked with 10 gigawatts of overseas coal power capacity to draw up a timetable to withdraw from the sector. Beijing is the largest source of financing for coal power plants globally, and Xi's announcement will have a far-reaching impact on coal power expansion plans in countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam and South Africa. However, Xi's carefully worded statement revealed few details and left room for existing projects to continue. There are already more than 20 Chinese-financed coal-fired power units under construction in the world, according to data from the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. Another 17 are in planning stage. The new commitment also doesn't address China's plans to expand its own coal-fired power plants. According to a report published by a European think tank, China's domestic program accounts for more than half of all the coal-powered plants under construction through the world. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.